Um, okay, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, my name's Alex Jones, and I'm a student in Ian Wormsley's group at the University of Oxford. And today I'm going to talk to you about interfering photons in orthogonal states. So it's kind of a catchphrase in our field that something is at the heart of the mystery of quantum mechanics. And quantum interference is one of those. Um, it happens whenever there are indistinguishable paths leading to the same measurement outcome. So a famous example of this is the double slit experiment, uh, where there are two different ways for a particle to get to a point on a detection screen. And those two paths interfere, and so you get a fringe pattern in the detection density. Now, any information that distinguishes which path the particle took uh, degrades that interference until eventually uh, total distinguishability means you don't get any interference ranges. Something similar happens in Hongwe Mandel interference of two photons, which Benny mentioned earlier. Um, in this case, if your photons are prepared in orthogonal states, uh, then paths to coincidence detection don't interfere anymore, and you return to kind of classical dynamics. So in both of these, you can kind of see that distinguishability means loss of interference. So it's natural to ask, does that extend to larger multiparticle systems? Um, and today I'm going to show you that in fact, it doesn't. So in fact, particles in orthogonal states can exhibit quantum interference. OK, so Benny's already talked about this briefly. Um, so I'll just recap Holmium mantle interference. So the idea is that you've got uh, two photons uh, injected into ports of a, an interferometer, and they're in a separable state where one of them is described by A, the other by B, and that contains information on like polarization, color, temporal mode. And if you have a balanced beam splitter, this mixes those spatial modes, and then you do coincidence detection at the outputs. And it's not hard to write down the probability of a coincidence. So you have this kind of classical contribution that you get from just considering probabilities probability separately. And then you have this uh, contribution from the kind of exchange uh, of two particles. Um, this is the quantum interference term uh, that is a real number between 0 and 1, this uh, overlap here. Uh, it's 0 when the states are distinguishable, and it's 1 when they are indistinguishable. And so this number controls the strength of uh, two photon interference. And so everyone knows the Hongwe Mandel dip used to benchmark sources where at the bottom, you have a suppression of coincidences because everything's distinguishable, and then you return to the classical probability when you've walked off temporarily. So that's Hongi Mandel. Um, what we want now is a nice way of capturing how these exchanges show up in the interference statistics. Um, and there's like a toy model that um, a colleague of mine, Adrian Menson, and also some theorists came up with, um, borrowing exchanges from the kind of graph model. So the idea here is that you, you have the vertices, which are the interfering states, and then you have an edge between them, a directed edge with a weight given by the overlap of the interfering states, which I've written in modulus argument form. And so here we can kind of loosely associate this process here, sort of A switching rail, with this arrow. Now the rule of this game is that uh, to find out the contribution to interference, I have to make a closed loop on one of these graphs. Uh, so in this case, what that means is that the arrow has to go from A to B, and then it has to go back from B to A. Now, these contributions are complex conjugates of each other. So when I multiply them together, I just get the pairwise distinguishability, which is what we had for Hongi Mandel before. Um, so this is a kind of neat way of figuring out how your states show up in your interference statistics. OK, so what happens when we add more particles? So now if we consider uh, three photons with states A, B, and C, and let's assume that they all have some overlap with one another. So in that case, you have a little graph where it's fully connected. So all of these exchanges are possible. Uh, just as before, we have these two photon contributions, like in Hongi Mandel, uh, where you'll just get a real number between 0 and 1. Um, but you'll also get an extra type of contribution due to the new exchange possible, so where all photons change their spatial mode. And the interesting thing here is that now the phases of these overlaps around the edges don't necessarily cancel as they did for the two-photon case. So in fact, what we now have is a dependence on the argument of the first edge plus the argument of the second edge plus the argument of the third edge. And so the sum of those is some kind of overall phase that we call phi ABC. Um, now, the interferometer also supports the exchange going the other way. 
And we depict that just by the same loop, but traversed in the opposite direction. And so when we uh, count coincidences at the output, we're going to get contributions from two photon interference. And then when we add these contributions together, we'll get a cosine dependence on this new phase that we call the triad phase. Um, and we did some experiments a couple of years ago uh, that were looking at how we isolate this property from the two photon interference. OK, so we can keep going. What happens if we add another photon? <coughs> so now we have uh, four photons in states A, B, C, and D. And again, we're going to assume that they all have some overlap with one another. Now, the fully connected graph um, now supports this kind of four-edge loop, um, which corresponds loosely to this kind of exchange. Um, and so this four-particle phase will show up in the interference statistics if we do coincidence measurements. Uh, now, this, the fact that it's fully connected means that actually we can decompose this four-particle phase into the sum of triad phases. <coughs> so that basically means that you could do a series of three-photon experiments, measure statistics, and then use those to guess the outcome of a four-photon experiment. And in fact, this paper here shows that that's scalable. So if you have n photons, uh, none of which are orthogonal, you can always describe the interference by two and three photon experiments. A natural question is, OK, what if we break that property? What if we break the connectivity of this, this graph? So in particular, let's say now that state A and state C are orthogonal, and state B and state D are orthogonal. This now means that we, we can't do that decomposition. We can't decompose into triad phases. But we still have multi-photon interference. The coincidence statistics are still going to have a dependence on this, this kind of four-particle phase. And so even though Hong, kind of intuition from Hongwe Mandel would suggest that no interference will take place, you can see the multi-particle interference is actually quite different. OK, so how do we prepare some photons with this kind of connectivity? Uh, we use two degrees of freedom. We use polarization and temporal mode, because they're not too difficult. And we're going to uh, set A and C to be orthogonal in polarization, and the other two to be orthogonal in temporal mode. And this is how we do it. So I'll walk you through this. OK, so we, we said that states A and C are orthogonal in polarization. And we've accomplished that in the block sphere by having A as horizontal and C as vertical. So they're orthogonal in polarization. Um, but in temporal mode, they actually have the same, the same profile. They have a broad wave packet. Now we want B to overlap with A and C. So in polarization, we put it in the diagonal state because it has a little bit of an overlap with A and a little bit with C. And in temporal mode, we walk it off slightly and have a skinnier wave packet. Ooh. Hopefully that works. Yeah, It'll come back. OK, great. Um, OK, so yeah, it's in a skinnier wave packet, but it still overlaps with A and C. So we've got A, B, and C as we want them. Now D has to be orthogonal to B. And the way we do that is we put it in a different temporal mode that's completely walked off in time, um, but which still overlaps with C and A. Um, and polarization-wise, it's going to be rotating in the equator. <clears throat> and what that means is that as it rotates in the equator, uh, that basically varies this four-particle phase, because it varies the argument of one of these edges. Um, at the same time, we ensure that there are no triad phase contributions, because no three states overlap at the same time. And finally, we've also kept all of the pairwise distinguishabilities constant, um, because in time, we don't change anything. And in polarization, as D goes round the equator, it always stays at right angles to H and V. Um, so this is our state preparation that should allow us to see uh, photons interfering, even though pairs of them are in orthogonal states. OK, this is the setup. So I'll come clean, but I think this is the integrated photonic session, but this is as unintegrated as it gets. Um, so what we've got for generating our photons is a pair of spectrally degenerate factorable uh, KDP crystals that are parametric down converters. Um, so down here, they're pumped by a frequency double TISAF. Um, they naturally produce, uh, in type 2 down conversion, uh, orthogonally polarized signal at idler. And one of them is naturally wide in time, and one of them is naturally skinny in time. Um, so we have two of those. And we use wave plates to prepare their polarizations. And we use delay stages to set their time delays. And then we inject them into this interferometer 
which I kind of cheated by putting a box around it, but actually it's a completely bulk device. It's actually just got a lid on it. Um, so the way we do this is it's a balanced 4x4 interferometer called a quitter. And it's basically four balanced 50-50 beam splitters. So it's kind of on this schematic here. And we simplify the design by folding it twice. So we folded it over itself using these retroreflectors. Um, so basically on each, each of these two faces of the beam splitter, uh, the colored arrows represent photons that we're sending in, and the gray arrows represent the four outputs that we're monitoring for coincidences. Um, so then we hook these up to avalanche photodiodes and count coincidences. So basically, in this experiment, we're just going to be rotating that polarization around the equator uh, and looking for fourfolds. And these are our results. <coughs> okay, so what have we got here? So this first plot is the singles counts out of that device. So there are four output channels that we monitor throughout the experiment. And as a function of this uh, phase parameter that we're tuning by rotating around the equator, uh, these are all basically flat. So the error bars are too small to show. So there's kind of less than half a percent variation. Uh, this top right plot is the uh, two-fold coincidences at the outputs. Um, so there are six different pairs um, that you can look at at the outputs. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that those are flat as a function of this phase to show that we've kept the pairwise distinguishability constant. And again, within error, they're flat. The error bars are too small to show. Uh, the bottom left, we've got the three folds. So this is now looking at the four different ways of getting three clicks at the output. Uh, again, these are flat. And that's good because that means that we've eliminated the triad phase and its effect on our coincidences. And finally, the signal that we're actually looking for uh, is this raw signal. Um, so this raw signal is the four folds as a function of that phase, and it should have a kind of cosine shape. Uh, and it's predicted to be 10%, so it's a very low visibility feature in the first place. And we measure 9.5 plus or minus 2%. Uh, I've also shown here the background subtracted four folds. And I won't go into too much detail here, but that's basically subtracting off the double emissions uh, from each of the, the down converters, um, because the probability of having each one fire once is the same pretty much as one of them firing twice. Um, so what I look at here is the fact that all the lower orders are flat, but we still have uh, a variation in our fourfold coincidences. And so this is our evidence that, in fact, you can have multiparticle interference despite pairs of your photons being in orthogonal states. OK, so just to summarize, uh, I told you that intuition from one and two particle experiments would suggest that distinguishability means loss of interference. Uh, but in fact, using this little graph model, I've shown you that you can prepare photons in such a way that that's not the case uh, when you have four of them. Uh, I showed you some of the data that we've taken uh, showing that four photons can be correlated in this way. And I think the take-home message here is that a kind of naive approach to thinking about interference as kind of <coughs> indistinguishability is good, distinguishability is bad. It's fine for most of the applications that we're dealing with, um, but there are some subtleties in considering the exchange symmetry of these multiparticle systems. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank the people who are involved in this work. So Adrian is a student who helped me in the lab. Helen's my postdoc. Uh, Valerie Shesnovich is our theory collaborator in Brazil, and Ian Wormsley uh, led the group. And that's it. Thanks for listening. We have time for one question for Alex. Thanks, that was a great talk. The um, Shechnovich result about the breaking down any interference into basically triangulating mm. these graphs. Yeah. Are, are, are you contradicting that now and saying that? Uh, so he, he said that's true as long as none of them are orthogonal. So as long he, as what, sorry? As long as none of the states are orthogonal. So if you have a fully connected graph, mm. then you can always patch it into triangles. I see. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. so. Uh, just to run on time, let's thank uh, Alex again. Yes.
if you have more questions for Alex, you can uh, ask him in the ship. So I have a couple of things to say. I would like to ask 